I'm going to email him. Know what's happened every end of day, and he started to open the meeting and has now disappeared. Um, so I'll just welcome everyone and um, <clears throat> see if Dan comes back. Otherwise, sorry, Marilyn. I just I, I've been booted off our network twice and yeah. I've called the help desk, so I'm trying to get it resolved. But please okay. forgive me if it does happen. I'll try to quickly share the agenda and then everybody can continue after we okay. connect. Okay, sounds good. So, welcome everyone. Um, let's see, let's do a quick introductions. Uh, Marilyn and Dan Larochelle, I think, are are known. Steve, could you introduce yourself for us? So, uh, Steve Harrington with the National Center for Supply Chain Automation. Just listening in as a guest, and Marilyn and I have been uh, chatting more recently about a project we're working on. Excellent, excellent. Well, welcome, Steve. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to start my agenda of things that I had uh, to discuss today were recruitment for our programs, retention. Once we get them in the program, what are we doing to retain these students? Um, four year mechatronics programs. I, someone asked Marilyn to discuss if there were maybe a list, if we were keeping track of a list of four year programs that our students could transfer into and then that also leads into are there any articulation agreements with our mechatronics programs? And the last thing, if we have time, was possibly to discuss, you know, how how our colleges are overcoming the stigma that's attached to engineering technology versus engineering transfer. And and I'll open it up on the floor. Are there any other items of interest or concern that people would like to discuss today? Greg Chapman, I see that you just joined. Welcome. You're on mute. Let's see. Sorry. Let's see, let's see if I can. Um, I want to uh, just mention what uh, Steve um, talked about this other project, and he's with the Supply Chain Automation NSF Center. That's a national center around supply chain automation, and their curriculum really overlaps. Um, a lot of almost everything that we do. I would say the only component there is a, a welding component, and we're working on some. Some we're working on a symposium that they're going to have in the um, next spring in Chicago. But also just kind of uh, merging these two groups of really with the that are offering the same curriculum, but to different. Um, Kind of different industry sectors, so they're really focused on the the automation in um, and mechatronics in the big supply chain industries, the WalMarts, the Amazons, etc. And we, most of us on this um, call, have been focused on manufacturing manufacturers, and so um, some opportunity to bring those uh, schools together, and this was one one place where I thought we might be able to do that, so um, at least as a starting place. So um, uh, that has nothing to do with recruitment and stuff, so I'll just get off the phone, but I want to <laughs> give some, some more background to Steve since he did sign in today. So, And great. Thank you, Marilyn. also want to welcome Doug Pauly and Greg Chapman. I see you guys have joined. Uh, you are both muted, so when you start the Skype meeting, it automatically puts your microphone on mute. And, and that's of course okay if you've got background noise and you would like to be muted, but if you want to want us to hear you, you, you will have to unmute yourself. Um, Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. I always stay on for a while, but I thought I'd join for a little while today. So thank you. Welcome. Welcome, Doug. So uh, let's let's start with recruitment. Um, 
I'll start off and just share with you one innovative recruitment technique that we've been using that's proven to be fairly effective. We offer a STEM H summit. And we do this in partnership with business and industry. So it's almost like a job fair, but we recruit between 40 and 50 businesses in the STEM fields. And then we bring all of our feeder high schools. So annually we've had 10 of these events and it's been an average of about 500 high school students. So we all know being a, a junior or senior in high school, trying to figure out what you're gonna be when you grow up or what you're gonna do after high school is sometimes difficult. So part of the STEM H Summit is the students go through the booth of industry and we, we didn't have them ask any questions. Now we have them ask questions like, you know, what skills are necessary to work for your company? Not just how much money can I make? You know, what, what type of education do you need? And what type of career opportunities are there? And it's proven to be eye-opening. And part of this round robin is they go through all of our STEM programs. So they'll go through biotechnology, they'll go through mechatronics, they see engineering transfer, They'll see electrical engineering, mechanical specializations, and also the trades. And so that's, that's proven to be helpful recruiting students. We typically get five to six students a year um, recruited from that event, which, you know, out of 500, it doesn't seem like much, but I don't know that we would have recruited those five or six students from those high school programs had we not done the summit. So um, I can share information on the summit. Terry Drumheller, who works with me, just sent out the invitations and the recruitment flyers for the event, but does anyone else have any innovative recruitment techniques that they use? <laughs> in recruitment? Well, we just had an open house about a week ago, uh, maybe two weeks ago, and we ended up with 300 people, um, but we had 14 businesses come and set up tables um, throughout our technical areas and they had information at their tables, but we did kind of what Dan said. We had the students have to ask questions to each of the tables, to try to get a little better insight of what that company really does. Um, we invited anybody in the community. We had kindergartners there and we had grandparents there. Um, it, it was very successful. We had hot dogs and, um, tips for the people to eat, but we were ecstatic in getting that many people from the community here. That's so great, congratulations. Uh, was that campus-wide, Doug, or was that just for your technical programs? That was just for our technical programs. It was part of our manufacturing month, and we worked in partnership with the chamber um, that helped promote it. But I would guess we had people from 30 miles radius of Columbus, so that was a good thing. So Dan, we're, we're doing something that is uh, uh, totally new as well, and that is um, we're taking and we're working with one high school currently, and it's called the Real School, um, and we're taking all of their freshmen and bringing them through our technical center, and um, they have eight different courses of study, over the entire school year and those courses of study are five weeks in length so we have electrical engineering mechanical engineering technology mechatronics um, we have welding uh, cnc machine cnc machining uh, it uh, it security etc but anyway there are five different uh, or there are eight different um, uh, courses of study. The students in their freshman year come for um, uh, 45, it's uh, 45 or 50 minutes and um, they learn, uh, and it's five days a week for them, and they learn about um, over those five weeks a particular course of study. Now this is our first year I don't know how it, I don't know the results, um, and, um, but that is something we started in September. We uh, were in the, the second uh, 
uh, five weeks, so we're approximately ten weeks in. We'll be in the third one uh, a week after next. And um, uh, you know, I don't know what results that <laughs> that that's going to give as far as um, um, additional students to our program. But uh, at this particular point, we have uh, uh, this particular school has a 125 um, freshmen and they will see all of our programs uh, over the over the course of the uh, over the course of the year that's so that, great that's very innovative is this a is this a required class or do they get any type of credit for the course how does it fit like in the in their high school schedule it is a required class and um, it, they do get credit for it the credit is not the credit truly is, um, uh, they're using it like a social studies credit, um, uh, studying of industry or something like that. I'm, I'm not even sure uh, what that is. And uh, for us, it, it, it is a pass-fail. Um, basically, if they attend and if they do the labs in each one of the uh, classes, uh, uh, they, they, they pass. Um, but it, it is a 100% requirement for that uh, for the freshmen in that Congra school congratulations that's a it's big to get a superintendent or a school system to buy into looking at the career and technical programs for every student so so i congratulate you who is paying for the tuition um the high school's paying for the tuition and is it a one credit three credits how many credits is it it is uh, one credit so are they there all day or half a day or uh, they're there for 40 uh, well 55 minutes is uh, um, five days a week and again uh, you must be pretty close to this campus um, about a mile away yeah. so they bust them over they actually come in for so some other things that we've done with this with this same campus uh, uh, to give you an idea, we have a we they knew that they they wanted to target engineering, so this is not mechatronics, but it's our mechanical engineering program, and we took the the students that are in, interested uh, in mechanical engineering. So that's uh, that's 32 students, uh, 16 students in each of two classes, and uh, they're they're here and they're taking our college classes. Uh, in the in the morning, so from seven ten in the morning until uh, ten fifteen in the morning, which is their block A, uh, they're here taking. Uh, they they took AutoCAD and um, uh, uh, PM, PMI, which is Precision Measuring Instruments, last year. That same group of students now is back this year as sophomores, and they're taking SolidWorks, our standard SolidWorks. They're taking advanced SolidWorks, and then they're taking material properties. Each of those are two credit classes, and they will get uh, they will get uh, um, gateway credit for those, as well as they will get high high school credit for those. Um, That's and great. We we do something very similar. Call it the regional academy. I started um, 11 years ago, and it they, this fall semester they took AC and DC fundamentals, pneumatics, and hydraulics, and then a applied technology course, which is aligns to the manufacturing technician level one certification. So it's it's very similar, Greg. That you you I like your recruitment idea as a freshman, and then if they want to start college early, are they able to do this both as a uh, junior or senior? Yeah, they're, they're able to continue. So what happens is juniors and seniors, uh, they can take our ACDC1, ACDC2. Um, uh, they can select hydraulics, pneumatics, or we call it fluid power. And so they get, they get a, um, shoot, what's the other course? There's one more. So they can select the courses that they would like to take. Uh, they're in the process also of um, uh, our IT de department, and so I th I'm pretty sure the, the last one there was an IT, uh, and I'm not sure if it's called IT security, or I IT data, something like that. Um, so yes, they're uh, quite a variety. 
That's great. Do you, have any, do you have any literature or any papers that kind of explain that a little bit? Um, I, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> um, my, uh, my dean might. Let me, uh, let me ask uh, Ray Kukari, my dean, uh, if he's got something. It's, it's something um, that uh, truly our, the president uh, of our organization, um, uh, Brian Albrecht, um, wants to uh, wants to help drive the technical education down into the high school uh, levels to try to get the career um, assignments or the students to have an idea of where careers are, and and that's really what started it. So that, that's uh, we're in the second year of that. So the, the freshmen that you're involving, that's 32 as well, or that's 32 in these other classes? The freshmen that I talked about, that's 100% of their, their freshmen. That's 125 students. Oh, my the, God. These other, <laughs> uh, uh, these other classes, uh, students have specifically um, said that they, that they have an interest in mechanical engineering or in IT or in electrical engineering, and then they come in and can take these classes uh, specific, and they get college credit and high school credit for them and the college credit they get just and they're taking the exact same class from the exact same instructor that would be teaching it to our traditional student uh, is, except that it's uh, it's um, at the it's being given to high school students that's so those, that's great those eight topics that you talked about that's just an exposure to all of those kind of just to let them know what it's about Yes, and that's specifically for freshmen, and that's just an exposure class. That particular one, yes, that's just an exposure class. But but that opens the door so they can think about it and determine that they, it's what they want to do as a junior or senior, not wait till they graduate high school and play video games and bag groceries. They, they're, they're getting a little better prepared. I, I love it. We'll try to send Marilyn the literature. I'll send the information on the regional academy. We just opened it up to science. We now have a science, and they're opening up ag and an IT track in our regional academy. So I want to um, just jump in here a minute and say that I think what we've um, all begun to learn is that working with the high schools is really challenging, and they have um, instructor teacher issues like we do, and the even a lot of the instructors that they that hi, they hire to teach these programs don't know enough about the real industry, um, and so it's becoming um, important that the two-year colleges actually take on the role of guiding that whole process instead of um, letting the high schools go off and do their own technology programs, which and often end up in disarray and disconnected. Uh, um, yeah, let me move, let me move in there and partner with them so they have some better direction and a connection to advanced education and stuff. So I think those are both great um, examples. Thanks. Yeah, let me let me be clear. These are these are gateway technical college employees that are teaching okay. these classes. So the the high school at this particular point, those those full classes, SolidWorks and and uh, AutoCAD and. Uh, uh, material properties and precision measuring instruments and and ACDC and uh, one and uh, DCAC two uh, digital electronics those are taught by gateway employees those are those are instructors teaching for the college not high school instructors those currently just so you know every one of those particular classes those are contracted classes, so we're contracted to to uh, uh, give those class, and those are those are, as I say, gateway employees. So we we don't have the issue with does the high school not have an instructor with uh, adequate training in that area? Um, um, you know, it's yeah, that's right. That's what I was assuming, and I just said that it's really important that we actually take on the role of. Um, at the colleges, you know, providing that instruction because it's, it's um, unless you do, uh, like Dan has in Virginia Western, over the years cultivated some um, high school teachers and done a lot of mentoring and training, 
um, it's hard to find ones that students can actually, you know, move into the technical program smoothly. And so, you know, getting down there and taking, <laughs> kind of taking over, I guess, <laughs> a little bit, but, um, you know, helping them find the right way to, to get a good technical program for their high school students. And it often means that we have to teach it at the colleges. When you That's say great. when you say that you're contracting that you're contracting with the high school to deliver those classes for them, correct. And they're paying their contract is paying tuition for those individuals. Those classes, that is correct. Um, how do you handle overloading your faculty with these classes? Um. <laughs> we currently, here again, we've been running this. This is the second year that we're running it. We now um, have faculty that are saying that they're, they're that it's too much. So I'm 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 not sure. Um, we are we are out trying to hire like everybody else, uh, uh, you know, uh, instructors to to teach those. Uh, at this particular point, all of the classes have been put on uh, current faculty, and all current faculty is uh, they're taking them on a overload situation. So, so I, I can speak to that a little bit. What we did, I had a dean that had the vision of doing this, and so it, it was built into our schedule. So we didn't have to take overload; it was already built in. Of course, I always have done the overload, and it, it can. It can bear down on you, but you just have to remember. So kind of what I've done in the Mechatronics program is I offer a light version of the same course in the associate degree, and that goes to my career studies. So I don't have to teach it, teach it at the same rigor and relevance as I do the classes. Now, of course, mom and dad want everything to transfer and everything to go into that associate's degree, but you have to let them know that their son or daughter may not be ready for that class at that level yet. and I've gotten a lot of pushback through the years. So over time, I've added more classes that do go into the associate degree because parents don't want to pay for a class that doesn't go anywhere. Um, but once they get into a class that does and, and they kind of have their butt handed to them, they, they realize that they kind of appreciate the foundational classes. So um, any, are there any other discussion on re recruitment? Okay, I'm assuming no. So how, how about we move into the topic of retention? Um, our college has, and I'm sure all colleges across the country have realized some decline in enrollment. And if the number crunchers do some analysis, they determine that they could retain hundreds of thousands of dollars if they could retain the students that we've already worked very hard to recruit. And you know, life happens, but there are things that we can do to help our students. So one way that we've worked to retain our students is I've required a one credit course called engineering problem solving. And I support the technical math course, the physics course, the statics course, and basically any course that they may be taking at the college. It, it does provide a difficult preparation because you don't know what you're going to be hit with. And I've asked the students if they could please send me their questions ahead of time so I could do my homework because I haven't done some of these physics problems in a few years. Um, but that's one way that I've focused on retention. And then the second way is I've been doing group advising um, now. There's been a push for college to, faculty to spend more time advising students and less time with general advisors. So I've been advising as a class and asking the students to log into their portal and determine their curriculum on their own and then make a stab at what their next semester courses should look like on their own and then i'll go over that with them and if it does meet the requirements and they have all the prerequisites and things look good i'm able to register them register them for a pre-registration process so they can register early and get in the classes they need so i'll, I'll open the floor up on other ways of innovative retention. Not everybody at once. 
<laughs> with, with our instrumentation grant, we have two part-time coordinators, and one of them is focused on working with the students, talking with the students, more building that relationship. And then if they're having problems getting some developmental help for them on some of the, if it's electrical or whatever, they're trying to bring in some experts that can help get them up to speed. And I think that has helped us quite a bit in the last two years with that project. How are Doug, they funded? Would, yeah, yeah, would you be able to keep those people after the grant? Actually, I think our administration sees that it's important, and I think they're willing to invest in those part-time people um, because the, the tutors that we bring in are already funded by the college. It had to be somebody that just was willing to help spread the word that we had those tutors available. And so I think building that relationship in the classroom, kind of like a career coach, a little bit of a mentor, um, has been beneficial. So they show up in the classroom probably a couple times a week and talk with the instructors and then also talk with the students and find out who they need to get more help for. Um, early on in the semester is the, really the critical part of it. And so once the relationship is established with the mentor, then it's between the student a little bit and the mentor to, to kind of, and the tutor to kind of figure out a schedule that will work for them. Our, um, this is being uh, driven by our institutional effectiveness um, folks. And um, to be honest with you, I'm not a I'm not a big fan, uh, but uh, I I happen to be just finishing it uh, currently uh, for uh, mechanical design and for our, our mechatronics, which by the way they change from mechatronics to advanced manufacturing technology uh, uh, this year. Uh, but the um, um, it, it's called. Boo. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, and so they're calling it Program Pathways Review. And so what they're requiring of all programs is that what, they, what they've told us is there are national studies out there that show that if students complete their math and English requirements, they have a much higher, and they gave percentages, I, and I, uh, uh, I, I don't, I don't, you know, um, liars use figures and figures that lie and then whatever. But anyway, uh, they gave us figures that show that if students take their their college tech math, their their basically their math requirements and and so forth, and do their English requirements, that they have a much um, better likelihood to complete. So they now gave us pathway forms to fill out. And we are required to take uh, our math and English and uh, put it in as um, uh, prereqs and corecs um, throughout the entire program. So a, a student can't um, can't skip the English and math requirements and get through the program. They're required so. You know, and and this was there before. But for example, this is mechanical design. Um, the first semester is where the college tech math one is and English comp, and the second semester, which is statics, uh, uh, requires that they take the math. The third semester, uh, mechanisms and strength of materials require that they take the statics. And then uh, elements of machine design require that they take the mechanisms and strength of materials. So basically, there is a pathway for mathematics through the program. And so they have to take the math early on in order to go through the program. Uh, basically, we've done that same thing in, um, in our uh, new advanced manufacturing program as well. Um, and it. Um, uh, what uh, my objection is, and this, this is uh, because I, I, I teach both in mechanical design and in, in uh, mechatronics, uh, my concern is, is that I have many students today that come in 
and get their technical requirements so they learn SOLIDWORKS, they learn AutoCAD, they learn CREO Pro-E, they learn Inventor, uh, all of which are required in our mechanical design uh, program, and they job out. Well, these students may have come back, and I know uh, because, because I've been with these students for some time, they, 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 uh, while I want them to complete their degree, like anybody else, they job out because they have a requirement to put food on the table and pay the car payments and pay the house payments and those kinds of things. And uh, our college, I think, is, is um, in an effort to, to make completers um, they may be also making an effort to have students not come to take classes. So, um, and but, I would also add, Doug, Greg, that um, if the students don't have the life experiences to apply the English and the math, and let's just say the math specifically, it, it's it's uh, regurgitation, not really learning. You know, and, and sometimes they struggle in the math because they can't really figure out how to relate it. So I echo your concerns, and I do understand uh, uh, trying to combat them jobbing out. I understand what you're saying. They get enough skills to get a job, and they go right to work. Yes, and I mean the same thing's happening in our mechatronics. They, they get through the hydraulics, pneumatics. They get the first PLC classes and that, those kinds of things, and uh, they, you know, there's a... Um, in other words, they get the basics uh, on how to turn a wrench and how to do some programming and how to uh, troubleshoot uh, um, uh, systems, and they they also job out. Uh, uh, and I mean, we have employers that are, you know, they want our students and they want them so badly they're taking them before they complete. You know, to me, we need to work more with our employers to say, yeah, you know, that's fine. Take these students, uh, do it as an intern or something like that uh, to give them the, the funds that they need. But, uh, you know, you need to you need to be pushing that they, they, they become completers as well. Yeah, that just proves the demand is great, but it it does also prove the short sightedness of the student that if they lose that job, yeah. They only have the work experience, but not the background or the, the degree to go work somewhere else, because some other company may not appreciate part of an education. Very good. Any other? This is great discussion. How about any other comments from everyone in the group? I did see that Doug Laven's having a hard time uh, logging in, but we have a, a great crew already. Any other innovative retention strategies? I'm not sure if people have access to work studies. Um, but I purposely ask everybody at the beginning of the program uh, if they have any financial unmet need. And I work with our, work, our, our college to make work-study positions for some of those students and use them in my labs. I find that you know, the students that have, a, that have that financial need typically haven't been around a lot of this stuff. So getting them into the labs, working with some of our lab techs, working with some of the other students, kind of builds their confidence uh, and gives them, the pay is not great, but it uh, just gives them that extra lab time that might strengthen, like, might have them complete. So we, we do the same thing. It's a great idea. It does help retain students because they have some buy-in and a connection, right? They, they're not just mailing their skin in. They have a little more skin in the game because they're, they're feeling some pride. The, my only concern is we have students that are struggling that don't have the financial needs too, but it does help those students. Um, for those students, I, I found a workaround on there too. I, uh, I make them tutors. <laughs> so we can, you know, SolidWorks tutors or, you know, Things of that nature. Just every college has little nooks and crannies where they hide money, and most of it's federal money. So, you know, there are ways that you can get some of those students compensated, even if they don't have financial need. That's great. Congratulations. Those are great retention ideas. Does Does anyone else have some ideas? Steve, is there anything in the logistics realm that that you've used in recruitment or retention? 
I'm just uh, kind of listening in and learning from you folks. I actually have an industry background, and I'm not in, in the academic on the academic side of the center. Okay. I just I want to make sure there's fair and equal opportunity for everyone to share. Thank you. Thank you for offering. Yes, sir. Anyone else? We can move into four-year mechatronics programs. So we all know that um, our degrees, most of our degrees are AAS degrees. I know in Florida, Maryland has done a great job of having their degree in the AS um, realm, but parents, unfortunately, feel that an AAS is a dead-end degree, and that limits them, right, in their, you know, career opportunities, so they're less likely to go in. So I went back to school to get my master's so that the degree would transfer, and we have an articulation agreement with Old Dominion University, and through our NSF initiatives and going to the SAE Mini Baja competition, we met with Niaz Latif at Purdue University Calumet, and they, we now have an articulation agreement with Purdue University in Indiana. Now, I've only been able to get one student over the past five years to leave Virginia and travel up there, um, but I just opened it up to the floor now, and uh, we'll take notes on the, the four-year university programs. Dale, your transfer agreement with Purdue is for what's the degree in? The degree is in Mechatronics Engineering Technology as a bachelor's. Okay. Sorry, my phone was ringing. I turned it off. Um, they do have a bachelor's degree in, in Mechatronics Engineering Technology there. Um, NC State also has a degree in Mechatronics, but it is a four-year engineering degree, and they want... No, so most of the universities want at least pre-calc and calc one before they transfer. So for our students, there's a transition semester of taking the second semester of English, English comp. They have to take the advanced maths. If they haven't taken pre-calc, they'll have to take that in calc one. They'll have to take a chemistry class. And I think that's it. It's just basically one transition semester. But like NC State's microtronics program, they want everything through Diffie Q's. Dan or Doug, do you all have any articulation agreements or, or four-year programs that take your degree? Yeah, we have, um, we go to, our UNH Manchester is our MET program. And if we want students to go to UNH Durham, which is more mechanical engineering, they're actually math, they, they go through the program as a math major and they take two of my classes to kind of round out that degree. Seems a little backwards, but that's, We've done that with seven students so far to the four-year school. Um, but there's a huge push right now for, like, a new advanced manufacturing bachelor's program at both UNH Durham and Plymouth State. And they're now coming to us saying, how can we work with you to make that two plus two transfer? This has never happened before. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that just tells you that the demand is great. Yeah, uh, our dean went to James Madison University and in their school of ISAT, which is Integrated Science and Technology, they are very uh, interested in taking our students. I, I just I struggle with. It's not a degree in engineering or engineering technology, and I don't know that industry will recognize it as much, but there's some students that just, you know, want to go to JMU. So I think the more opportunities afforded to our students the more uh, students we're going to recruit, because that, that seems to be a, a underlying theme with the parents. Now, I'll, I'll honestly, uh, less than 25% of my students go on and articulate and, and get a bachelor's degree. But I don't know that the other 75% would be there if the opportunity wasn't there. Anybody else have comments on that? I can Dan, tell you that. I, Go ahead. I, didn't, I didn't hear, Dan, your last part of your conversation for some reason it cut out, but um, we at Central, we have a couple of colleges that are transferring our two-year program 
but they're not transferring into an engineering program. They're transferring into uh, more of a human relations degree program or something like that versus engineering program. We are talking with Pittsburgh State in Kansas um, about having more of a going into their plastic injection molding engineering certificate program. Um, and they seem to be very interested in doing that. Um, their program is just really an expansion of a two-year college almost with a little bit more in-depth um, into those projects, getting more into some of the science and the money parts of it. So um, I think that that might work out well for us as well. Go ahead, Dan. Okay. Um, the when we introduce the two-year degree path, the two plus two to UNH Manchester, it literally tripled the size of our enrollment. Um, so that said a lot to me. So I've been really focusing on making sure that that is a well-rounded and that pathway is a lot more clear to people. Um, you know, certificates are great, but as soon as you can start connecting the dots to a four-year school, at least for the parents, it's it's a, it's a game changer. I agree. And, and I'm just going to add one caveat to this. One of my students who was a Fab Lab technician, um, who was a phenomenal student in mechatronics, graduated, um, transferred to ODU, and, and did horribly his first semester. Now, Part of this was life. He was engaged to be married. He called off the engagement. And, you know, there were some other things that I'm sure affected his success. But I just I, I'm, I don't know if you all are experiencing this, but we've we've had Old Dominion University come visit our campus and go through our labs and their faculty and, and their deans and their administration were just floored with the amount of resources we had compared to them because they're still teaching theory and, you know, chapters one through 13 and answer the questions in the back of the book. And I think our students, you know, we have to be real careful that we we prepare them for that environment, even though what we teach is hands on and hands on does not mean minds off. It, it, it I just want to make sure that the rigor and the relevance of what we teach is preparing them for that transfer. And it's a shame that that we have to to do that, I think, in some degree that but that, that is kind of the, the way that the cookie crumbles sometimes. All right, last topic. Um, and that is how to combat the stigma of engineering technology versus engineering. Um, I, I am getting a lot of students from the engineering transfer program because our engineering transfer program is really geared directly to go into Virginia Tech. and I just ate lunch the other day at a restaurant and there was a girl in engineering that took my orientation course and she remembered my name and asked her what she was doing and she's now doing early childhood development. And I asked her why she got out of engineering and she said it's the coldest program I've ever been in in my life. And as a male, that might be kind of difficult for us to understand because we know the number crunching, right? But it really hit home to me that how if we want this program to be diverse, we want it to recruit all walks of life we have to gear a program that accommodates all backgrounds and if you if you if this program is cold and number crunching and just very much rigor very little relevance um it, it does make it difficult um for that but my biggest concern is these students feel substandard when they switch from engineering to engineering technology and it takes me a semester to to bolster their confidence that they haven't chosen um, do you want fries with that degree or under basket water weaving? You know, engineering technology is still a rigorous program of study and, and keeping them in the degree. But I, I'll open it up at that point. Does anybody else have any ways that they combat the stigma of engineering versus engineering technology? I've been pitching it more engineering technology um, as manufacturing engineering. And that's kind of the spin I've been putting on. Almost all the people that 
go to UNH Manchester with an MET or an EET are going into the manufacturing and it's more hands-on, more relevant. So that's kind of, I always pitch it theory versus practical. You want to work with your hands, you want to work with your mind. Like, and that, that kind of sets home with them a little bit uh, because, the, again, the kids in my program want to touch, feel, play with it rather than think about it. There's a, a really good document that I'll send Maryland after this too that the state of Ohio did that really talks about the differences between engineering and engineering technology and the job duties and the math required. And I love to show this chart in my class and I asked them, I set them up, who earns the most money? And of course, research engineering is at the very far end, but we all know there are people that work for in the aerospace industry or in the research industry that they'll get a contract for a month, uh, six months, a year, and then they might be out of work. Now they've earned you know, maybe a six-figure salary in eight months, but they might have a hard time finding work. So they have to balance the stability. But I, but I also show sales engineering is one of the very first, the least math. And that's another opportunity to earn six figures that our students aren't aware of. So I, I'll share that document so people can use it in their classroom to just help differentiate the difference. And in the, in the real world, they're a team, right? Engineers and engineering technicians and technicians and uh, maintenance guys, they all work together to solve the problem. And, and so I think in this higher education world, this stigma is, is preventing good people with technical knowledge from entering our degrees. That's just how I feel personally. All right, I, I'm getting silence out there, so maybe I'm talking too much. Um, but I, I do think we've gone for 15 minutes and I just want to open it up on the floor. Are there any other topics that people would like to discuss today to, to gain resources to make their microtronics program or their advanced manufacturing programs more successful? This is Steve. I have a question um, to the, just the group in general. And this is uh, kind of relates to our interest in, in popping in on the call or my interest on popping in on the call. So we're working on our annual, an annual symposium around supply chain automation at a large industry conference in Chicago uh, coming up in April. And uh, one of the things is, you know, so our hopes, uh, our hope is to convene a group of between 40 to uh, 50 uh, academics, um, a community college or technical school level from um, maybe 15 to 18, 19 states across the country. And um, so we're bringing this group together and share best practices and do some tours and tour an industry trade show and do some different stuff. Uh, featured uh, highlights of NSF resources and all. Um, but at the outcome, at the end, it's at the end of the day when it's all over. It's okay. It's kind of like the discussions about what is next. And um, you know, in terms of bringing the group together, you know, we've made some connections, but how do we give legs to the connection? So Marilyn, you know, we've been having this dialogue a little bit, and, and Marilyn mentioned the Mechatronics Community Exchange to me. So um, I don't know, could, could any of you comment on kind of the value and the, 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 um, the value that this sort of um, monthly dialogue has had for, for you and or kind of how, the, how it's evolved over time? Uh, and do you think it's a way where we could introduce something like this to our group and to try to get either partner with or come up with our own method of um, having some form of our own exchange. Um, I don't know if that's a kind of a broad ranging topic, but if anybody could comment on that. Certainly, Steve, I'll just start. So this, this group started a friend of, a mutual friend of Greg Chapman and myself knew that he wanted to start a mechatronics program and I wanted to start a fab lab. So he connected us and we just spoke monthly on you know, it's basically trading nuggets. Um, <laughs> what curriculum do you use? Well, what equipment do you have in your fab lab? Uh, what lab do you run? Um, where did you buy your equipment? So it was really just helping each other back and forth with, with a need. Um, I find a lot of value in it, and, and I like the fact that that's open-ended that we can kind of just bring to, now sometimes that cannot add value if you're not interested and it, it doesn't help you as much um, but educators today are doing more with less 
And if we work as a team, I think we can meet industry's demands at a greater level than if we sit in our own little island trying to figure it out. I've picked up nuggets today on recruitment and retention. And, and I would say that I'm glad Marilyn connected you because part of the mechatronics skill set, logistics is an outcome. Uh, it is, uh, it's frustrating to me kind of in the US that we diversify and separate ourselves so often that we almost dilute. And I, I'm a firm believer, I think this is the PMMI conference you're talking about attending the packaging conference right in Chicago? No, it's actually, uh, it's ProMat. So it's the largest um, uh, show of its kind in the Americas. And it's all of the companies, the integrators that do the automated material handling equipment and systems, along with now what is an e evolving component of uh, the use of robotics in those applications. Oh, that's great. And and that's really the mechatronic skill set. So I, I think it definitely makes a connection. I'm going to be quiet and open it up to the floor. Does anyone else have some comments for Steve? Well, I was on the other end of that, uh, um, <laughs> starting with, with Dan Haran uh, when uh, uh, the, this mechatronic ex exchange uh, started. And what it, what it really did was uh, gave me an opportunity to make sure that uh, I had uh, basically um, competencies and knowledge and was teaching the right thing and it, so I could com you know compare notes to someone else that's been out um, uh, teaching um, and had a program that's out there that is successful and and looking at you know what do we what do we need to have in our program what are the changes that uh, that uh, someplace else in the country is seeing what are their uh, employers asking for in education what are they using I mean, I mean so Dan's using Siemens and we use Alan Bradley's and you know what are the differences and what what, what are the similarities and what what should we have or shouldn't we have and and um, it, it, that's, to me, what has um, been so beneficial is basically to be able to uh, bounce ideas off. Uh, I, I, I've been a while since I was at one of these meetings because uh, my schedule just didn't, didn't, uh, didn't fit. Um, but um, uh, I, I find it beneficial, and I pick up, as Dan said, little nuggets, just little things that, uh, maybe I could try this. Uh, you know, I, I have an I have an area of need here or there, and uh, let me let me give that a try in my in my program. So, um, somebody else to look over. Uh, Dan and I shared, uh, uh, and, and in fact, I think all of us shared our um, our programs uh, and uh, uh, changes that we've made and things that we were thinking about, and it and it gave us a, a way to to share I'm going to say what our employ what our needs are but what our employer in the area needs are which that means that it's if, if, if we're a large enough group that means that we're getting uh, a countrywide um, um, uh, look at um, at, at mechatronics uh, as, as an education Steve does that help uh, yeah it helps um, it helps some the um I mean, I see the relevance. So in the past uh, two and a half years, I've probably toured 30 different campus, campuses in about a dozen states. And I see all sorts of different models of success and levels of success and different things people are, are doing. And, you know, your discussion about recruitment and then retention is part of that. I mean, that just fits right in with some of the dialogue that I've seen. It's just a question of trying to get people to share best practices and to build a community around it. And it's just kind of a struggle with competing schedules. And, um, you know, I know you guys have been on this a little while. Um, I would imagine the group's probably been bigger at points along the, along the way. It has. It's grown. You know, it, when we started, it's just Greg and I. And, and I've been pushing. Um, you can just hear in this one conference call already that there's still a disagreement on what you call it. You know, is right. it advanced manufacturing? Is it logistics? Is it mechatronics? And I... I struggle with that because I, I came from industry and, you know, I'll share with the group that I'm going back to industry. This is my last semester in education. Um, mm -hmm. 
I'm done with the politics and the bureaucracy and the the anyway. I'll keep it positive. You know, it, there's a need for this skill set in the workplace, and it's a shame that industry is suffering because of what someone wants to call it in higher education. And I would I just encourage people like yourself to to get get everyone on the same page and and work with education and. I think that that's going to be the solution. We have to be globally competitive. I don't want my paycheck signed by China or India or some other country. And I just think it's essential that we do that. Thank you. Certainly. I think that's about about an hour. It's 1058. And I just want to thank everyone for coming. I know Marilyn had to step off because she's at an airport and probably stepped on a plane. Another participant, uh, Doug Laban, had a hard time connecting today. But, Steve, we thank you for joining. Greg and Dan, it's always a pleasure. And Daniele, thank you so much for organizing the event and making it happen. All right. Have a great thank day, you. everyone. Yeah, Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>